Well, take your, the Word of God with me, if you would. Go to Acts, please. Acts chapter 12. We're going to look in a couple of places in the Gospel records. If you'll turn there, we do call it a Bible study and prayer meeting, so I know you got your Bible there. We want to turn a little bit, and we'll look at a few passages together. But we'll come back to this thought of the series, The Master and His Men. And uh, I'm so grateful that the Master still works wonders with humble, humble clay. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't have much to work with when you look at yourself in the mirror, does he? And yet he will take you, and it's not about what you are, but what he is. It's not about what you are when he found you, but what he can make you and mold you into. And the Bible says he's at work even now to mold you into the image of his son. It's quite amazing, isn't it? What God is doing in all of our lives, and our Savior is still looking for men and women into who he can impart himself. Uh, that's really the treasure. I was talking to the young people. It was a great time in chapel today with our Christian school, and uh, we sang a song that talked about this treasure we have within us, uh, grace greater than our sin, I think we were singing, and uh, that treasure in clay, that treasure in a in an earthen vessel and just dust, the treasure is Jesus. And so not much in the vessel, but when you have inside the vessel Jesus, it's worth quite, quite a lot. And so praise God for that. And though they, these men that we're, we were studying, have been studying, were just men. They were just men, but they were instruments in his hands. And that's what makes all the difference in the world. Um, and that's exactly what God wants to do with you and me today, make you an instrument in his hand. If God would allow us to yield, if we would be willing to yield to him. Acts chapter 12, we'll just read the first three verses to start. If you found your place there, the Bible says in verse 1, Now about that time, Herod the king, this is Herod Agrippa the first, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. It means he beheaded him. And when he saw it, Please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. We won't keep reading, but if you did, you'd find out what happened with Peter. And Peter got miraculously removed from the prison and so on. But we're coming today and focusing in on this apostle, the apostle James. We kind of started with the lesser known, and we've worked our way all the way in these next four, including tonight are the most known of the apostles. This is probably the, one of the more unknown, though he was in the inner circle. Uh, but we know a lot about John, a lot about Peter, but James, uh, not as much, but those were the three that made up the inner circle. And so we look tonight at this title, James, the son of Zebedee. James, the son of Zebedee. Let's ask the Lord to help us and bless the reading and preaching of God's word. Heavenly Father, we'll thank you for what you do tonight in my heart and the hearts of those here, or the teens and meeting behind us and the children in these other rooms, I pray that you would work throughout this building. May you bind Satan and may your Holy Spirit have his way in hearts. May put out of our mind everything else and focus in on you. May all of our eyes get a glimpse of Jesus and be on the Lamb of God tonight. Speak to us. Thank you for what you've told us in your word and what we can study and know about you and how we learn about you as we study each of these men and each chapter of the Bible, we find more out about our God and who you are. And so reveal yourself in an even greater way to us tonight, and we'll thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I got an email from Jenny Taylor a few weeks back now about James, the book of James she's been studying, and uh, was asking about the author, and it's interesting, there is some debate, uh, because the Bible is not, and by the way, anywhere the Bible is not explicit, it's not dogmatic, we shouldn't be dogmatic about it. Because if God wanted to tell us explicitly about something, he certainly could have, and he knows how to put words together and help us understand. And so he can do that. But there's some things he just, it's not necessary we know, we didn't need to know. I believe the Bible is not all God knows, but it's all God wanted us to know about himself. Uh, certainly the Bible tells us just about Jesus in the book of John that, excuse me, if all that Jesus had done would have been written. The world could not contain the book. So we understand God knows more than this, and more has happened in, 
in the world than just this, but this is what God gave us. And remember, it's not a book of history, though everywhere it's historical, it's accurate. It's not a book of science, so everywhere it talks about science, it's accurate because it is truth. But it's a book about God. It's a book about God. It's a book that reveals Jesus to us. It's a progressive revelation. Every book, the further you go, you are revealed more and more to finally the perfect revelation in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that He is the express image of God. See, God's a spirit, but Jesus came in a body, bodily form where He was the perfect representation of God. You want to know the Father, He said? You know me, you've known the Father. Because He was God. And then God put in our hands now, thank God, the complete revelation of Himself as we have the complete canon of Scripture. And so what a privilege it is to study our Lord and know Him as Paul would exclaim there in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him. He had already given up everything. He had already said, I counted all things as loss for the excellence of knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. But he didn't want to just know about Him. He wanted to know about a personal... He wanted to have a personal relationship with a personal Savior. He wanted to know Him. And what a challenge to our lives. Well, these three James that are in the Bible, there's the one we're going to study tonight, the, one of the inner three, James and John, brothers, sons of Zebedee. Then there's the James that we've already studied, James known as James the Less, or James the son of Alphaeus. Uh, we've talked all about him when we studied that one specifically, but he was called the Less because they believe he was smaller in stature, he was a shorter man uh, than James uh, of Zebedee was. And these were two of the apostles. But the third James, some don't believe there is a third James. Uh, okay, that's where the little debate is. It, but it doesn't make any difference. But I believe that there is a third James. If you have a Schofield reference Bible, he actually doesn't. He only believes in the, that there's two. It really doesn't make much difference. But the question comes up uh, about who wrote the book of James. And it was either, they say, James the less, or it was James the half-brother of Jesus, who is the third of the James, uh, if you fall, and good men on both sides of that. But where you would get the idea that there is a half-brother of Jesus named James is 1 Corinthians 15, 7. The Bible says there, after he was resurrected, Jesus specifically met with James. That's interesting. We know he met with Cephas, and he, Paul was saying, last of all, he met me, apostle born out of due time, he would say. And then Galatians, Paul would write about in Galatians 1.19 about James, the half-brother, the brother of Christ. We know half-brother because God was God, the son's father. Joseph was his legal father. But uh, anyway, uh, all that is very interesting. Regardless, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. The author of the Bible is God, and so whatever the human penman was. But it's very interesting. And again, we don't know explicitly, and if the Bible wanted us to know exactly, it would tell us. But there are three James, I believe, in the Bible from these three in the New Testament here. And one thing that's interesting about the word James, anyone know what the Old Testament name James is in the Hebrew? James is the Greek. In the Hebrew, what the name is? You know it? No? It's Jacob. Jacob. So James means supplanter. <laughs> he that grabbeth at the heel. Trickster. And so this is the New Testament name, Jacob, which, of course, God changed his name to Israel. And, and uh, you know the story of Jacob there in the Old Testament. Most of us do. Interesting here, this James, this is the only time in the Scriptures that James, the one we're studying tonight, the son of Zebedee, is mentioned alone. Every other time it's James and John, James, Peter, John, all like that. Uh, James and John. But here he's mentioned by himself. This is the only time, and it's his martyrdom in Acts chapter 12 where we're at. James is almost like if you've ever been on a boat when there's weather and you're in waves and it's not a really enjoyable time in that, especially if you're on a smaller craft and you see a, another boat in the distance and the waves go up and down. When you go down in a trough and it's he, large waves, I've never been in real bad, but I've been in where there's 5, 10 feet and you're going up and down and on a small boat, I mean, it's you go down and all you can see is the water. And if you see a boat out in the distance, you may see it. Now you don't. See it? <laughs> now you don't. And then sometimes if it's real bad, you have to both time where you're on a crest at the same time to see the other craft because the waves are so bad, depending on the size of the other vessel. James is almost like that. Uh, you hardly get a glimpse of him here or there throughout 
the, the, the New Testament, though he's one of the twelve and though he's one of the inner three. Not, he doesn't say a whole lot. You don't see much of him. Uh, you can study it for yourself as you read through. But uh, you get just glimpses here. and Most of the time he's out of sight, it seems. Uh, no one probably marveled more that God chose him than James. Uh, why would the master choose me? You don't see James standing and preaching, thundering forth. You don't find that. In fact, the relative silence about James is ironic. Because if you go to the human perspective, James was always mentioned first. It wasn't John and James. You never find John and James. It's always James and John. Reason being, James was the eldest. He was the older of the two. And uh, he, humanly speaking, you would think would have been the leader of this group. Peter, James, and John. You got these brothers, James and John, Peter and Andrew. Well, of the two families, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were a much more prominent family. Uh, we know that because over and over the Bible will call them the sons of Zebedee, and Zebedee is a prominent figure uh, in, the, in the Scripture. As far as, you don't even know hardly who Peter and Andrew, we know is the son of Jonah, but you don't know much about Jonah. That's what Bar Jonah, Simon Bar Jonah, means son of, Bar means son of. But we don't know anything about Jonah, but Zebedee is mentioned all throughout. Uh, interesting, but James kind of doesn't dominate the group at all. He sits back. Zebedee was, the wealth, was a wealthy, uh, prominent businessman. The scripture says that he had uh, his sons ship, uh, fishing with him in his business and hired servants. So he was quite well to do. Uh, he was a political figure, many believe, and perhaps even a Levite, and was in with the priests, um, which is possible why the night that Jesus was betrayed, John was inside the high priest's house, if you remember. Now, James had run for him, but John was in the house, and John got Peter into the courtyard where he could see and hear what was going on, and finally he denied the Lord. We know the story three times, right? And Jesus turned and looked at him. So he was that close, and John had got him in. We know that from the Gospel of John. And so, interesting as you study, those are just snippets here and there. That's not the main line of the story. The main line of the Scriptures is all about Jesus. Uh, he's, the, he's the central figure of the story. But as you pick up about who these people were, now Zebedee and Siloam, that was Zebedee's wife, James and John's mother, Siloam, uh, they were most likely the Lord Jesus' uncle and aunt. James and John being his cousins. These probably knew Jesus from the time he was born. I mean, it was quite miraculous circumstances around Jesus' birth, if that was your nephew. Uh, you know, I mean, all that happened with, with uh, you know, the wise men and the angels and just all of it, I'm sure they knew, they knew Jesus from when he was small. Uh, probably many times Jesus was in their house as well and, and were around them. Uh, during those 30 silent years where we know so little but desire to know so much about what happened during those years, but the Bible doesn't tell us, does it? Um, but they would have known some of that, certainly. Um, I think James really is more of a more significant figure than we realize, though the Bible doesn't give us a lot of information. If you just had take a cursory reading of the New Testament, you might not pick it up. But as you really begin to look at James, uh, first of all, I think he's a more prominent figure than we might realize because of what I've already mentioned, some of these things. But secondly, because every list of the apostles you find his name near the top, two of them, he's the second right after Peter listed, Peter then James. Uh, not only that, as I already mentioned, he was one of the inner circle. So this is one of the closest three to Jesus, but it's just he was one that kind of slipped into the background a little bit. He didn't open his mouth like Peter and insert foot all the time, so we don't have those things. But he was privileged to witness Jesus' power. He was privileged to see him raise the dead, and he saw his glory when he was transfigured. He saw Christ's sovereignty as he gave that great Olivet Discourse on the Mount Olives. Uh, unfolding the future to them what would come he saw the savior's agony in the garden there and that brings us to the three things to share with you tonight three p's number one james was privileged he was privileged as a part of that inner circle james was privileged to be chosen by jesus to see some things that only peter james and john saw well what were those they these are Significant occasions, in fact, things that really, I believe, bolstered his faith as it would have you and my ears and mine. Uh, one, first of all, was Jair Jairus' house. Remember? 
Jairus' daughter lay sick and was dying, and they get there, the mourners are all mourning, she's already dead. And Jesus said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. They laughed him to scorn, and God said, the Bible says Jesus put everybody else out except Peter, James, and John and her parents. And so he got to see, can you imagine being in there? Uh, you know, I'm, I guess it don't ever get old or you get used to it, but once you'd seen him raise some of the dead, you wouldn't have been that surprised the next time when they saw the others. But can you imagine? This hadn't happened in hundreds of years since the time of Elijah and Elisha. I mean, this is someone being raised from the dead, and Jesus invites you inside to see, and he says those words, and she, daughter, I rise, and she sits up and eats, and I mean, that'd be something to shout about, that'd be quite something, you talk about emotional, uh, I mean, wow, what God did in there, can you imagine being there, his first ministerial face-to-face -face with death experience, as he's standing there with a family that just lost their 12-year-old daughter, and God raised him, raised her up, he saw the Lord's greatness, I think it began to rob death of its terrors in James' mind as he saw what the Lord had, he had victory over death. Later, of course, he saw when Jesus stopped that funeral procession and raised the widow woman's son and of Nain there. Then he saw, like all of them did, at Lazarus' tomb when he called Lazarus to come forth. Um, no wonder, I guess, James was such martyr material in Acts chapter 12. He had seen and he knew Jesus had conquered death. Uh, death was nothing for Jesus to handle. He had conquered it in all its power. Then he was not only at Jairus' daughter, one of the three that were there, but on the Mount of Transfiguration. Can you imagine? All of a sudden Moses and Elijah showed up. <laughs> Start talking uh, to the Lord. Uh, then Jesus is transfigured before them and glory of God clothed in God's glory maybe not much different than Adam and Eve in the garden before sin where they were clothed in light interesting God kind of pulls back the veil there and lets them see his glory only them three got to see it of course the Lord on the way down the mountain told them not to tell of that until after but he was one of those that saw the Lord's glory the Lord's greatness is mentioned in the healing. And then he saw the Lord's grief. He was one of the three that Jesus invited into that inner prayer meeting in Gethsemane when he asked them three to come a little further with him and watch with me. Would you watch and pray with me? Uh, my soul is, is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Would you pray with me? And James with the others fell asleep and did not stay awake and pray as the Lord had asked. Now, I really believe that he determined that night that he forsook the Lord. The next time I find myself in the place of danger for my life for Christ's sake, I'm going to be a man. I'm going to play the man. I'm going to give my life for him. I believe he determined it in his heart, in his mind, in his soul, all his strength. Like 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. I think he determined. I forsook him once. John was there in the priest's house. Peter was afar off there uh, watching. The rest of them forsook him, including James. He was privileged. By the way, we're privileged as well. Uh, we have the Lord Jesus living inside of us. We are children of the King. We're privileged people. Uh, no doubt about that. The Bible calls us a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are his ambassadors uh, in this world. He was privileged. We're privileged. Number two, we see he was passionate. Passionate. I want you to notice uh, with me in Mark. Would you go there to Mark just for a minute? Then we're going to go to Luke. We're coming back to Acts if you want to put a marker in there. But go over to Mark. If there's a key word that applies to the life of the Apostle James, the word's passion. Passion. From the little we know, he was a man of intense fervor. Mark chapter 3 and verse uh, uh, 14, we uh, talk about the first call on, our, on the life of the apostle. He ordained 12 that they should be with him. That's God's still call to you and me. Be with me. Come to me. I want to sup with you. I want to reason together. Come, be with me. Every day, I believe he comes to our life wanting to be with us and us with him. 
And then that he might send them forth to preach, in verse 15, to have power to heal sickness and cast out devils, Mark 3, verse 16. And Simon, he, surnamed Peter. Well, who's the he? Well, Jesus. <laughs> he said, Simon, you're not going to be called Simon anymore. I'm going to name you Peter. All right, look at verse 17. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them. So who's the he? Jesus gave him a nickname. Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. <laughs> So Jesus gave a nickname, and I don't know if he used it some in fun, some gentle correction, but just like Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, he named James and John the sons of thunder. <laughs> Interesting, uh, this, what the Lord did with them. Uh, Luke 9, go there with me, would you? But they were zealous, they were passionate, they were fervent. Luke chapter 9, look at verse 51. Here's an example of that passion. Jesus had been through Samaria before, in John chapter what? John chapter 4, right? He wants to go through Samaria. By the way, whenever John the Baptist went into prison, we studied that in Matthew 4, the Bible says that Jesus left Judea and went back to Galilee. That's the trip that he went through Samaria and met the woman at the well. John gives us that story. Matthew doesn't. Anyway, that just helps us as we're thinking through the Scriptures how it, they all go together. But here is another trip through Samaria. Now he's headed to the cross. Luke chapter 9, he's got a following now. There's a group of them. And look what it says in verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he's going to die, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of Samaritans to make ready for him. So if Jesus is going to spend the night somewhere, there's a crew of them with him. There's a multitude traveling with him. They went ahead to get things ready and prepared to eat, to sleep overnight, and then to continue their journey. Well, the Bible says in verse 53, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt that we command fire to come down from heaven and command them even as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them. You know not, and said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. That's interesting. You go back to the Old Testament, Elijah. You remember, wicked Baal-worshipping Jezebel and Ahab. They had a son named Amaziah who fell through the lattice. The Bible talks about that. Fell the lattice and fell, was hurt, injured badly. Well, Amaziah was just as wicked as Ahab and Jezebel and followed in their footsteps. Jezebel was still alive at this time. And he sends to Beelzebub, the witches of Beelzebub, the soothsayers of Beelzebub, to find out if he's going to live. Sends these people, and the Lord says, Elijah, go meet those people from the king and, and uh, speak to them. So Elijah gets there and says, Thus saith the Lord, is it not that we, there's no God in Israel that you send to inquire of Beelzebub, of, of Baal? Literally the God of flies. That's what he was. And Elijah says, this is what's going to happen. Tell Amaziah, he's not getting up off that bed. He's going to die. Well, he's sitting on a hill, and they take the message back to Amaziah, and Amaziah says... You go get Elijah. They didn't even know it was Elijah. They come back to him. He said, what do you look like? And he said, he's a leather girdle and this. Said, That's Elijah. Go get him. Remember? Captain in his 50. Go on the hill to get Elijah. And what happens? Man of God, come down. And he said, if I be a man of God, fire, come down from heaven and consume this captain's 50. And it happened. Wow. <laughs> and Amaziah sends a second captain's 50. Same thing. Man of God, come down, Amaziah the king. And he said, if I be a man of God, fire come down from heaven and to consume this captain's 50. And that happened. Finally, the third captain, Amaziah, sends again. And this captain has some wisdom, pleads with the prophet, say, oh, prophet, please, may, may my life and my men's life be valuable in thy eyes, be precious in thy eyes. Would you please come talk to the king, you know, and didn't order him, but entreated him. <laughs> and... The Lord said, go ahead and go with them, and goes down there and so on. But that's what they're referring to when they say here. Now they're in Samaria again, which is where the, the northern kingdom, where Ahab's palace had been. 
And, and uh, it was a, I think it was a different part of the country, but it was still called Samaria in that time. And so that's what he's referring to. And the Bible even says, like Elias or Elijah, that's the, should we call fire down from heaven on these people? So they have some biblical grounds. There's a precedent, right? But the Lord said, that's not the type of fire I came to send. Remember, he was going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, is what John the Baptist said about it. And yes, fire was in order, but not that type. It was going to be cloven tongues of fire, Pentecostal fire, not judgment fire, not this time. Now, when he comes again, it'll be a different type of fire. It'll be fire of judgment. But that time he came and he says to them, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Isn't that interesting? Because the Holy Spirit was going to come. It was a different spirit that was going to come. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, this is interesting. This is free tonight. But you go to Acts 8, and you have a great revival where in Acts 8? Philip's preaching. Where's the revival? It's in Samaria. Perhaps some of these same people that could have been devoured by fire, but God spared them and... Now, there's a great revival going on in Samaria in Acts chapter 8 after Pentecost. Interesting. I don't know if the same people, perhaps some of the same people. Jesus said, I'll just go to another village, end of verse 56. It was inconvenient. It was a pain. With a group of people, they went to another village that would receive the Lord. Uh, he didn't force his way in. But these men were passionate, weren't they? Let's call fire from heaven. Now, I'm telling you, there is a legitimate place for, in spiritual leadership for passion, for a thunderous personality like Elijah was, like Nehemiah was. You read Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 25, he is furious with them intermarrying with people against God's law. And the Bible says he is contending with them. In verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 25, Nehemiah, he smote them and he plucks their beards. He's so mad grabbing these guys that are intermarrying. <laughs> I mean, quite something. John the Baptist was a fiery personality, a thundered forth, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, but certainly there's a touch of nobility here in these men. It wasn't their testimony they were upset about. They were mad because they wouldn't receive their Lord. Uh, the, the zeal to defend Christ's honor, certainly there's some virtue in that, you know. That's what they were upset about. The call for fire was appropriate, but they didn't know the right type of fire that the Lord was going to send, and that was the Pentecostal Holy Ghost fire. Notice verse 55 there in Luke. It says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit ye are. They did not know yet the spirit that, of what spirit they were, but they would know by and by. Uh, just a few days down the road, they would understand. I mean, it was a blunder. It was a mistake, if you will, but it was a blunder of devotion. They loved their Lord. And it was great love. And they said, how can you treat our master this way? You will not receive him? An insult to James himself he might have put up with. I mean, the Lord had done quite a work on these fishermen. I mean, they were quite different than the men he found at this point. But to treat Jesus like this, they couldn't handle it. There had been a great change in their life since Jesus had met them. And what a privilege that is. I'll tell you, friend, the day you meet Jesus, the greatest day of your life. If you don't know Jesus, your Savior today, he wants to change you in every way that would be wonderful. He died for you. He says, I'll take your sin and your filthy rags and exchange them. I'll take them and give you my righteousness. What a Savior we have. If you don't know Christ as Savior tonight, that's what he wants to do. That's what he had done in James' life. And they were passionate for him. To mistreat our master, that was a whole other matter for them. They were overzealous, maybe, but it was a spilling over of a cup of love, of passion for their Lord. Happy is... The Lord Jesus that had a man like James that loved him. And I'd say twice as happy as the man that loves his master like that. Just passionate about his Lord. To be a Jonathan to a David. Uh, to be one of David's mighty men that would stand with him and encourage him to blaze out in defense of his friend's name and his friend's cause. There was some love here. Something I'm praying for in this church. I'm praying, God, give me some Jonathans. Give me, give me some of David's mighty men to say, we're going to go forward with God together. Oh, may God give us people like that. Stand and be passionate for their God. Be passionate for His church that He gave Himself for. Be passionate for God's man that I'm behind you, Pastor. We're with you. 
We want to serve God together. James and John were hotheads, but they're loyal hotheads. <laughs> they, were, they were for them. They needed some help a little bit, but they were for God. With zeal, maybe mistaken zeal, but it, they meant well, certainly. Are you passionate for Christ? What is it you're really passionate for? You ever boil over for Jesus? I can't stand to see these things being said about my Lord. And I must tell someone about Jesus. He's done so much. Is there, is there a passion that billows up in you for Jesus? I know sometimes it billows up for football or for something else. Uh, where is that for the Lord? Do we have a passion for him? So not only was he privileged and passionate, he was persecuted lastly. So until he sealed his faith with his blood, he's seen the quiet, strong, steady, dependable man working out his convictions and his indebtedness in consistent devotion to the master's interests among men. James' mother, Salome, here comes to the Lord. She had been an early, early follower of Jesus Christ. Like I said, I believe from the Bible you find she was related. She was the sister of Mary. You find her. She's one of the ones that believed in his kingship. She's one of the ones that the Bible says in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, ministered to the Lord Jesus of her own substance. She's one of the ones you'll find that followed him on his last journey to Jerusalem. Perhaps was with him in Luke chapter 9 here. She was at the cross. You'll find that in Mark chapter 15, verse 14, 41. She stood there at the cross. She was one of the ones there with John, her one son, with Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was there at his final suffering. She was one of the women, Mark 16, verse 1, that came to the tomb the next morning looking to embalm him further with the spices. So remembering her devotion to Jesus, we can forgive her being a little pushy here, as you might would think, in Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 20. If you read Mark's account of this, you might get the idea that she was put up to it by her sons, and that might be the case. But either way, she was a part of it. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 20. Now, some of this is an example of her faith. She believed in the kingdom coming. Maybe she was just thinking of the earthly kingdom. But God had already said, you're going to sit on 12 thrones with me. And that maybe got her attention. Boy, which seats? Who's sitting closest to Jesus? <laughs> Verse 20 says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshiping him. So the mother of Zebedee's children, this is Salome, and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said to her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these, my two sons, may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup. And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Anytime someone jockeys for position, it really upsets the apple cart rather than allowing the Lord to have preeminence. But interesting that phrase, it's going to be given to those who is prepared of my Father. You know there's preparations in heaven being made for you if you're a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. To the degree you serve, the Bible says you're going to be rewarded in heaven as you live for Him and love Him and follow Him and are passionate about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But He says here, are you able to drink the cup? Now, I don't know if they knew fully what cup He was talking about, but it was the cup of suffering He was about to drink of. Are you going to be in the baptism I'm baptized with? That wasn't talking about this type of baptism. It was talking about His death. And He was going to be the picture of that baptism, the death burial and resurrection of Jesus and they say we're able I don't know if they could have had any idea what was before them when they said that but basically Jesus was saying do you love me like that do you love me enough to go through all this business of the kingdom of God with me they said we can't we do love you like that no strings attached to that commitment and you have to believe it you go back to Acts 12 you find it came true for James here. He would drink of that cup. He would be baptized with that same baptism of death for the cause of Christ. In Acts chapter 12, where we started, we'll finish. The Bible says that he was faithful to the end, this one. 
what a privilege it is to finish strong. May God help each of us that will finish faithful. James did. The Bible says now, about that time, Herod, back in Acts 12, verse 1, the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Again, this was Herod Agrippa who murdered James in an attempt to secure favor with the Jews, and it made him happy. Verse 3, it says, and uh, he, because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Later, you know, this Herod is the one that accepted divine honors when he was given a speech. Remember, they said, he, he speaks like a god, and he received the glory and honor instead of giving it to God, and the angel of the Lord smote him, the Bible says, and he immediately was eaten with worms right in front of them all. That was the same Herod. But Herod here kills James with a sword. Interesting, James was the first of the apostles to be killed, and it's the only one that's recorded in Scripture. Everything else we know about what happened was told of, some told of what would happen. For instance, Peter, John chapter 21, you'll find that Jesus spoke of this, speaking of what death he would die, that you'll be carried about one day, speaking of he was going to be crucified. And we know in tradition states that he was crucified upside down, but all those are through tradition. But James, the only one that we know, the Scripture says exactly what happened. Acts 12, that he was beheaded. He was killed with a sword. James didn't do anything theatrical in the way of defiance, I don't believe. John the Baptist preached, remember, against... It was a different Herod, actually, then, but he went on steadfastly. It was Herod Antipas at that time. But he just went on steadfastly, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But James looked so different than everybody else, see, because everybody else was going the exact opposite, seeking self, seeking self, seeking self. You start living for His kingdom, seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, you're going to look totally different than the rest of the world. And James stood out among the crowd because he was passionate in love with his Savior. Are you bold for Jesus? Will there be evidence to charge you as a Christian? Do you stand up and stand out for Christ? Are you willing and happy to speak up for your Savior? James was. That's why he lost his life for the Lord. As we conclude tonight, the Son of Thunder has been mentored by Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, shaped by those means into a man whose zeal and ambition were useful instruments in the hands of God for spreading of the kingdom. History records that James' testimony bore fruit right up until the moment of his execution. The Bible doesn't say this. We know he was killed by Herod, but this is what the early historians, early church historian Eusebius says. He passed on this account of James' death that came from Clement of Alexandria. Interesting. Clement says that one who led James to the judgment seat, the one who led James to the judgment seat, when he saw him bearing his testimony, was moved and confessed that he was himself also a Christian. They were both, therefore, he says, led away together. And on the way, he begged James to forgive him. So here's the one that was turning James in. Here's the one that was helping to kill James. And seeing the testimony of James, according to the historian Clement, says that he confessed he was a Christian. Asked James to forgive him. And According to Clement, James, after considering a little, said, Peace be with thee, and kissed him. And thus they were both beheaded at the same time. <laughs> Interesting. We know he was faithful unto death. The Bible says, we know in the end, we faith, those who are faithful unto death received the martyr's crown. In the end, James had learned to be more like Andrew, bringing people to Jesus. Bringing people to Jesus. Instead of itching to execute judgment, call down fire, he was serving God to see that passion of Christ, to seek to save that which was lost had become his passion. And the Lord used him all the way to the end. It's interesting, you read Acts 12, one of the mysteries of God's providence, really, while God saved Peter out of prison, but not James. He could have, but he didn't, did he? He saved Peter, but James was martyred at that time. Now, Peter would later be martyred as well. James, through his mother, made that bid for the crown early on to sit close to Jesus, but he ended up in the end wearing the martyr's crown, and there in heaven he's wearing it, a crown that faded not away. He sits enthroned as one of the mighty apostles of the Lamb. 
That's James, the son of Zebedee. Let's bow in prayer.